December 1913, in Italy. A man arrives in Florence after a 16-hour journey. He checks into a small rundown hotel. He's here for a secret meeting with two of Italy's greatest art experts, and he has something extraordinary to sell. The world's most famous painting, the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. And it does take them a minute or two to realize it's the one. The Mona Lisa had disappeared from the Louvre in Paris two years earlier. It was one of the most incredible heists in art history and involved a police investigation across Europe, a possible forgery scam in America, and even the arrest of Pablo Picasso. Picasso was worried about being deported, and he was completely petrified. It's a story that brought the French art establishment to its knees and mesmerized the world's press. Stealing it looks so incredible that when they realized the, that the painting is gone, it is, yes, a real bombshell. Not just the theft itself, but the astonishing discovery of who was finally responsible. It is unquestionably the most important art theft ever. It's Tuesday, August 22nd, 1911, in Paris. The Louvre, France's greatest art museum, is just opening to the public. By 10 a.m., one of the first visitors to arrive is an artist named Louis Beru. He's come to paint his own interpretation of the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. Monsieur Beru had the idea of uh, doing a painting representing a nice lady. A young woman uh, redoing her hair in front of uh, uh, the Mona Lisa. As Baru turns to begin painting the most famous face in the Louvre, what he sees isn't Leonardo's 16th century masterpiece, but an empty space. Surprised and irritated, he goes to find a security guard to ask where the Mona Lisa is. The security guard doesn't seem concerned. Someone says, oh, maybe it's been, tra it's been transferred to the studio of the museum photographer, or maybe one of the keepers need, need the painting in his office. The guard goes to look for the painting, but it's nowhere to be found. Nobody at the gallery had put two and two together and thought this picture has been stolen. The reverential calm of the Louvre is about to be shattered. Moments later, the security guard rushes back to the gallery, saying, it's gone, it's gone. The unthinkable had just happened. One of the world's most famous paintings, started by Leonardo in 1503 and held in the Louvre for over 100 years, had vanished. When they realize the, that the painting is gone, it is, yes, a real bombshell. At 11 a.m., the museum makes a frantic call to the police. The authorities and the French government are about to go into meltdown. The Louvre is sealed off, every entrance locked, and a massive search starts. The préfet de police, Monsieur Lépine, with the inspector principal de la Sûreté, uh, who is the head of the French Scotland Yard, and with 60 uh, police inspectors. And they, they search the museum, they block the doors, they want to interview all the people. Inside the Louvre, there was now mayhem, panic, and shock. You've got something like 60 detectives running around the Louvre, interviewing everybody. You've got a, probably 100 or 120 gendarmes guarding the place, making sure nobody can go in and out. It was unthinkable that anybody would even consider stealing it. the most famous painting in the world. It was a catastrophe. The French art establishment was rocked to the core. There had been no elaborate break-in, no attacks on security, not even a previous threat. The Mona Lisa had been stolen in broad daylight.
By the early 1900s, the Louvre already housed one of the finest collection of art treasures anywhere in the world. In charge of this grand institution was an elite corps of intellectuals and establishment figures. They were very much the old guard appointed by the French government. So there were scholars, you know, uh, art historians, respected. So it was, yes, very much part of the, of the French establishment, yes. But the Louvre was no stranger to threats against some of its art. Anonymous letters targeting specific pictures had been sent in the last two years. But the Louvre's top brass dismissed these threats as cranks. There were letters to the Austrian ambassador saying that a group of thieves were planning to steal it and so on. I mean, none of this was, was true. And some minor thefts had been uh, done in the, in the Louvre, uh, statuettes, uh, antique statuettes and, and so on. So they should have then tightened their security. And in a sense, you could imagine that the authorities of the Louvre did not take any of these particular threats seriously. The Louvre thought they had reason to feel secure. They employed an army of security guards to patrol the galleries and the main entrances. But behind the imposing uniforms, there was deep discontent. The guards of the museum are not professional guards, but they are all soldiers and they are sent by the War Department. You know, it's a kind of retirement for all soldiers, and some have, have, been, have been in the, the colonial uh, army, and they are bitter, or some, some even are drunkards. They are just uh, bored people, and they, they don't really care about their job, and they sleep most of the time, or they go away without telling uh, the administration. Security was very lax. They did have security guards who would be on duty in the various galleries, but these weren't high-quality staff. And that wasn't all. Crucially, there was one key day at the Louvre when their security routine changed. For six days a week, the Louvre was open to the public, but every Monday, it closed its doors for cleaning and repairs. August 21st, the day of the theft of the Mona Lisa, was a Monday. It was a Monday, the gallery was closed, it had been busy the previous day. And what would happen on a Monday is that pictures would be moved around, they'd take photographs for the catalogues. Um, there'd be a lot of people around who were workers, um, who would be virtually under no supervision whatsoever. So this Monday, closing day of the museum, there are only 10 guards for the whole huge museum. Ten, and none in the Salon Carré, where the most prestigious Italian paintings are kept, because they are busy somewhere else. At 6 a.m. that morning, Vincenzo Perugia, a 30-year-old Italian carpenter, leaves his small flat near the Gare de l'Est. He'd been born in Italy, but moved to France to try to earn a better living. He was born in 1881 uh, near Como in northern Italy. And as many uh, poor Italian workers at that time, he just crossed the border and went to France to get some work. It had been hard settling in. His French neighbors weren't welcoming. They didn't like the Italians and made withering remarks about their habits and even what they ate. He's, um... Italian immigrant who has all the difficulties that immigrants have in you know, foreign countries, speaking the language in a faltering uh, way, being um, often uh, abused, uh, called macaroni by the French because of his, of his origin. The French put-downs rankled Perugia. At first he struggled to find some work, but eventually his skills as a carpenter paid off handsomely. He got a, a, a very significant job in the Louvre um, since he was part of a team of four persons uh, responsible for installing the glass coverings on the paintings uh, between 1910 and 1911. So he actually handled the Mona Lisa with three of his colleagues uh, to install uh, the, the glass coverings.
It's now 7.30 a.m., Monday. Perugia crosses the bridge and heads towards one of the smaller side entrances to the Louvre. Although he doesn't work here anymore, his face is still known. The countdown to one of the world's most audacious art heists has already begun. Perugia arrives uh, in the Quai du Louvre, near one of the entrances of the, the main entrances of the museum. The door, which it seems unbelievable, but the main gate of the museum was open. So it's very easy. I mean, you just get in like, as you would in a shop or, or a department store. Perugia, to all intents a worker in the Louvre, now heads towards the Salon Carré. The galleries are almost deserted. Perugia knows the gallery. Perugia has worked in the gallery. He knows that it's closed on a Monday. He knows that there are a lot of workers around. There's a lot of tradesmen. He knows that security is, is relatively lax on a Monday. And, and he's not going to be interrupted by members of the public who are going to be looking at the pictures. People are going to be doing other things. They're not going to be focusing particularly on the pictures. Perugia now enters the Salon Carré. Of course, he'll be a bit tense. He will be nervous. But, but he, in, a, in another way, he's quite relaxed. He knows what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. He crosses the empty gallery and quickly starts to remove the Mona Lisa from the wall. He'll know how big the picture is. He'll know how heavy it is. He will know how it's hung on the wall. He will know how to get it off the wall. And he'll know how to carry it around. Perugia walks calmly out of the Salon Carré with the framed Mona Lisa. He's lucky because nobody notices him. He's dressed as a workman, as all the other workers um, doing their job in the museum. So he is also very, very lucky, but it takes advantage of this, uh, the, whole, the neglect of the museum. But how could Perugia hope to get past the museum security guards and outside with the Mona Lisa undetected? Takes the Mona Lisa and brings it to a small uh, staircase nearby. But then he hears noise from uh, the stairs, somebody's coming. So very quickly, he sits down as if uh, he was tired and waits until the, the, another worker has gone away. He's got something very valuable. He's in a very risky situation. So he, he, he's got to find a way of getting it out. He's probably thinks he knows how to do it. He now methodically removes the frame and glass covering. He knows very well how to undo the painting from its frame, since he was the very man to install them uh, the, the year before, so, and leaves uh, in this small staircase, the frame and the window covering. Now, he just has the 16th century painting on a wooden board. He covers it with a white cloth. Then uh, he goes downstairs to see if the, doors, uh, the door opens. But when he gets to the door, he finds it's locked. He doesn't panic. Some people would just throw the picture away and, and run away. He doesn't panic. He's got the presence of mind to think it through, and he thinks he knows. He can, tr he can get the lock off the door. He starts to unscrew the doorknob, but with his escape route seemingly blocked, Perugia is now a sitting target for the security guards. But incredibly, his luck changes again. At that same moment, a plumber named Sauvé who knows Perugia, walks past. Again, he doesn't panic. Somebody else comes along, who he happens to know. And in, in fairly casual conversation, he talks about some fool locking the door. And here is his former colleague, says, oh, don't worry, I've got a key. And he lets him out. Now there's just one door left to get through. So uh, this gate called uh, Porte Le Fuel and the Day of the Theft, this is uh, the gate that uh, Perugia uses uh, to get out, out of the museum. 
Um, there was a concierge as in uh, any uh, building in Paris, a house in Paris, you know, a concierge, and you would ring a bell to, to get in, and then the concierge would pull a, a cord and, and let you in. Uh, uh, strangely, when Perugia wants to get out of the roof, the door is a schlar. So it doesn't, it doesn't even have to ask somebody to open it for him. So the door is open? Yes. So unbelievable. So he just walks it's, up. It's so easy. Perugia now hurries down the sidewalk beside the Louvre. He's still not out. The Mona Lisa is wrapped in a white cloth under his arm. Stopping only to throw the doorknob away, he now heads into the Paris streets. Perugia's route takes him through small Parisian back streets and home to his one-bedroom flat in Rue de l'Hôpital Saint-Louis. He walks up the wooden stairs to the second floor. It's about 8 o'clock in the morning, and now he reaches home, he feels relieved. He's done it. Nobody has caught him. This is uh, where he used to live, and this is where he kept uh, Mona Lisa, in a miserable room in this poor uh, block of flats. One of the most famous paintings in the world has just been stolen. The Louvre's security guards hoodwinked by an Italian carpenter. But no one would know the Mona Lisa had been stolen for at least another 24 hours. The Mona Lisa is considered one of the greatest examples of Italian Renaissance painting. So how did this masterpiece end up in the Louvre in France? We're not sure how the Mona Lisa ended up at the Louvre. As usual, there are different theories. One is that uh, Leonardo took the Mona Lisa with him when he went at the court of Francis I, the King of France. And when he died, the painting remained there. Another theory says that, on the contrary, he gave it to one of his scholars, one of his pupils, and then it was bought by envoys of the King of France, who was collecting Italian art. And, of course, he would have tried to get as many Leonardo as possible. So this is how the painting ended up in the royal collection, and they put it in the Louvre. By 1910, the Mona Lisa was a celebrated painting, but it was by no means the most famous in the world. The Mona Lisa was not a very well-known painting then. Um, of course, it was known among uh, art specialists and among artists, and, in fact, there is a rather large number of copies of the Mona Lisa uh, painted in the 16th and 17th century, and uh, many imitations and many paintings which were executed in the style of the Mona Lisa. So it was a well-known painting, but the crowds did not know about it. The Mona Lisa was painted on wood, and even then, her pose fascinated the public. In the middle of the 19th century, you already had the construction of a myth of the Mona Lisa. The story that the smile is enigmatic, sardonic, or castrating. And she was not just a normal woman, she was in fact a femme fatale, the castrating female and all the rest of it. And so by 1911, those who knew anything about the Mona Lisa would expect to read in the uh, visage of the Mona Lisa all the fantasies that the great romantics had put upon her already in the first half of the 19th century. But how did Leonardo create the mystique of Mona Lisa? Leonardo developed new and very extraordinary techniques in painting the Mona Lisa. One which he describes himself, which he calls sfumato, which literally means smoked. And that gives the, Le the Mona Lisa a sort of smoked or veiled effect. It looks as if you're encountering Mona Lisa through a mist, as it were, slightly out of focus. It makes her mysterious. It's very difficult to pin down what she's thinking. Our expression is determined largely by the position of the corner of the eyes here and the position of the corner of the mouth. We smile, it goes up, we are said, it goes down. What Leonardo does is that he blurs the corner here and he blurs the corner there, so we are not quite sure what the expression is. 
And because we're not quite sure, we make it up. We can invent, we can read what we like in it. So the so-called enigmatic smile is that there's a barely perceptible smile, but we are not quite sure it is one. And that is due to the fact that he deliberately uh, tried to have a painting in which the expression remained uh, mysterious. And there was one more trick that made Leonardo's masterpiece unique. Many of the paintings, the portraits of the time, were of people simply staring at you blankly. Alternatively, and even more popular, was a profile. Um, and so, you know, it's like a police mugshot. You don't get an awful lot of expression in there. What Leonardo did was to have, uh, at the same time, while the face is looking at you in a straight line, the body is moving slightly in a sort of, you like, three-quarter position. It is as if Mona Lisa was sitting in the conventional Renaissance position and someone calls her. And so, you know, she's like this, completely, and then she turns to face the person who is calling her. So it is as if she is in a, yes, a snapshot, but she was moving. The Mona Lisa was undoubtedly a painting of extraordinary interest. So it was even more amazing that 24 hours after Perugia had walked into the Louvre unchallenged, no one had yet noticed it had gone. As night fell over Paris, the Louvre's security guards were still blissfully unaware it had been stolen. By Tuesday morning, still no one had raised the alarm, despite the empty space on the wall. It's at this point that Louis Barou arrives to paint the Mona Lisa, notices it's not there, and then starts to complain to the security guard. He says, well, it's uh, at nine o'clock, the painting is not back to, to its uh, place, so this is not, uh, this is strange. Why, why don't you check with the photographer? So a guard sends another guard to see if the photographer, Monsieur Braun, uh, has a painting in his uh, studio, and then it is, it is not there either. So they start, but very slowly, and not worrying too much about it, to inquire uh, with the keepers, uh, etc. They don't know where the picture is. The director of the gallery is, is not there. He's, he's away, he's out of Paris. So there's nobody directly in charge who can say definitely this is where it's supposed to be. So there is a good deal of, of, of confusion, not even terrible concern in the first instance. It's just not where they thought it was. At 11 o'clock that morning, the terrible truth finally sinks in. The Mona Lisa has been stolen. Uh, they realize the painting is not to be found, and they tell uh, the man in charge with the museum, uh, Georges Benedict, uh, uh, they tell him, uh, Elle, elle n'est plus là. She is not there anymore. More than 24 hours since Perugia staged his incredible heist, the police are called. At 3 p.m., the Louvre is closed to the public. A frantic search begins. But the trail is already cold. The crucial problem for the police at the time was that they weren't involved until a very long time after the, the picture was actually taken. So the sense of urgency and of interviewing people who would have been witness, that's all lost. We're, we're then into an investigation where people, people's memories are a bit hazy. Yes, they maybe saw somebody around, but they didn't didn't really pay any notice. So that 24 hours is absolutely crucial. It's also crucial in the sense that he's gone. He, the, the picture's gone. Within hours, the police make a dramatic discovery. The frame and glass are found hidden on the staircase. By 5 p.m., the theft is headline news. The Louvre, now shut indefinitely, is left facing a public outcry and a monumental national disaster. They would have been completely horrified and in uh, very much alarmed for their reputation. In fact, uh, the director immediately resigned. He was on holiday at the time. Um, there was you know, an enormous amount of press coverage, especially by the popular press. 
So it was not an internal matter. It was not something you could, you could hush up. And indeed, even the French cabinet, the government, met and uh, you know, discussed this great loss to French culture and museum life. Traumatized, the museum clings to the hope that it might just be a stunt. Stealing it looks so incredible that to, to most people, I mean, it looked like a, a joke from somebody, maybe a journalist, would just then point out uh, the, how uh, negligent the administration of the museum was. But other theories come in thick and fast. They fear that uh, some maniac may have taken the paintings uh, to, to himself and, and might damage it or if, even destroy it. But Perugia had left one vital clue, the frame and the glass casing on the stairs. In order to get the picture out of the gallery, he has to take it out of its case and out of its frame. And, and that's a bit risky. It's risky in, in the sense that it might damage the picture. But it also means he's got, to, he's got to be out of sight while he does that. And he's got to, he's physically got to get hold of it. So he is likely to leave some clues. And we do know that, it, that in actual fact, he does leave a very clear, identifiable thumbprint. The French police, under huge public pressure, now turn to the man they hoped had the skills to track down the thief, Alphonse Bertillon a brilliant forensic scientist. Alphonse Bertillon was, was crucial, really, to the development of criminal records and, and systematic criminal records in France at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. He was absolutely central to the whole French system. French police, under Alphonse Bertillon, had just started pioneering a new technique in solving crimes. They were looking elsewhere. The French had tended to use a system which essentially worked on very precise measurements of uh, people who were caught and convicted of, of criminal offences. And although they had fingerprint technology and accepted the, the fingerprint evidence, this was regarded very much as secondary to the uh, what was called anthropomorphic measurements uh, that, 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 that they preferred. Having worked at the Louvre, Perugia was a potential suspect. What's more, he already had a police record. We know that he'd been arrested twice uh, in 1908 and then the year later. The first time he was drunk and, and um, tried to uh, rob a prostitute. And the other time, he tried to steal pipes on the building work or something like that. I mean, it was really menial but he'd been arrested and sent to prison for a few days for these two things. His uh, criminal activities before the theft were pretty pathetic. I mean, he did try once to mug a prostitute and she sort of smashed him back and he was arrested and spent some time in, in jail. So not the master criminal, which so many accounts of art theft um, enjoy describing. He was fingerprinted and his records had been kept on file. But there was a crucial flaw in the way police did their fingerprinting in 1911. They would have been very sophisticated in the sense that they would have very precise measurements of the distance between your eyes, the, the length of your forearm, the, uh, the size of your hands, the size of your ears, and things of that nature. They would have had very precise records of tattoos, scars, and other marks. But they would only have kept records of right-hand fingerprints. They didn't keep full sets of fingerprints because that reflected the, the relative lack of importance that they, uh, that they gave to fingerprint identification. They've got his fingerprints on record. They find a fingerprint on the frame, but it's a left thumbprint. So the fingerprint, in a sense, is, is useless. Convinced it was an inside job, the police had now interviewed over 200 Louvre employees, but had gotten nowhere. Along the way, though, they'd made a terrible blunder. Incredibly, they had forgotten to interview the team of four workers who had been making the glass to protect the Mona Lisa and other paintings. Among them was Vincenzo Perugia. They forget about the, 
the company who is responsible for uh, putting the, the glass coverings on the masterpieces of the of the museum. And this is a shame, really, because they, they've been told by, by the, one of the keepers of the museum that they should uh, check on the people responsible for the job. They, they just forget about it. So they interview almost everyone except the very persons who've been the closest to the, the, to the Mona Lisa before the theft. It was now a month since the Mona Lisa had been snatched from under the noses of the Louvre's top brass. The police investigation was going nowhere. But within days, the investigation took a dramatic new twist, and the theory of it being an inside job went out the window. Two new names suddenly came to the police's attention. They were anything but ordinary suspects. One was a poet, the other an up-and-coming Spanish artist who would in time change the face of modern art. Pablo Picasso was a young artist living in Paris at the time. He was yet to become world famous, but his work was highly regarded. Amongst his circle of friends was the French poet Apollinaire. He was in this gang of poets, it's called the Band of Picasso, and he and Apollinaire were great friends. I mean, they were, in a way, I think they were rather naughty. They actually sort of considered themselves to be a bit above the law, really, a bit sort of that they could do anything. Paris, in the early 1900s, had a reputation for extravagant dealings in art, and for some, it was a chance to make money not always the honest way. A mutual friend in Picasso's group had decided to steal some small Egyptian statuettes. Unbelievably, they'd been on display in the Louvre. It had been easy enough. Now he offered to sell them to Apollinaire, who accepted. But when news of the stolen Mona Lisa broke some months later, Apollinaire realized the stolen statues could make him a suspect. Apollinaire was terrified once the theft of the Mona Lisa uh, was revealed that he would be somehow implicated with the theft. But the trail of the stolen statues was about to get even more intriguing. Apollinaire had also offered one of the statuettes to Picasso, who knew nothing about them being stolen until now. He went to Picasso and said, I think I should just get rid of this statuette throw them in the Seine. Picasso alarmed, said, no, you can't throw works of art in the, in the Seine. I mean, for God's sake, just, just take them to the police. Both of them were convinced the police in Paris would trace the statues back to them. They were now in a tight corner. Le Polonaire went to the police station and gave himself up. And he basically, I think, confessed all. Now then, Picasso then went along to the police station and he, to his great shame, he just completely um, pretended he didn't know Apollinaire. Apollinaire looked at him. He was in, hand, in handcuffs, and he was, he was absolutely a broken man. And Picasso just looked past him, and he said, I don't know who that man is. On September 11th, Picasso was questioned by the police. He protested his innocence. First of all, the whole thing had been a joke, but then this became to be very scary indeed. Remember, he was petrified of being deported, and he, um, I think it really did affect him. It was an astonishing turn of events, but it was clear neither of them had anything to do with the theft. The police investigation had to look elsewhere. still living in his sparsely furnished flat in Paris. Perugia stuck to his normal daily routine, normal apart from one thing. The Mona Lisa was still headline news, and Perugia was understandably nervous about keeping it in his flat all the time. But that wasn't the only reason. Perugia now needed a favor from a friend. He knew another Italian on the same street, the Mona Lisa was about to move again. One of his friends called Michele Lancelotti is also a neighbor. And since um, it seems that the, the Perugia's room is not heated, so it's getting damp. 
And he's worried because this man is, you know, is very careful not, not to damage the painting. He's worried that uh, it could be damaged with the damp. So he asked Lancelotti to keep the painting in his room. So Lancelotti has nothing to do with the theft, but he actually kept the painting for maybe one month or two in his room. So we've gone from a position where he's the only person in the world who knows he's got it to a position where somebody else knows. And however much you trust somebody else, uh, the history of criminal inquiries is littered with cases where trusted accomplices have let people down. And so he is, at that point, very, very vulnerable and remarkably lucky. Um, given the hue and cry that there is around Paris at the time, uh, that his friend, who is a fellow Italian, probably shares some of his disdain or dislike of the French, and either doesn't realise what he's got hanging on his wall, or is is in the same sort of mindset as Perugia and, and isn't, isn't really going to tell the French authorities anything anyway. For two years, little more was heard about the police investigation into the theft of the Mona Lisa. Vincenzo Perugia kept a low profile, but he was still in Paris. We, we don't know much about him during these, uh, these years. Uh, at some stage, he leaves the company, uh, the glass company he was working for, he went on strike at some stage, and then we, we don't know much, no, we, don't, we don't know anything about him. But then on the 29th of November, 1913, a letter postmarked in Paris arrived in Italy. It was addressed to a well-known Florence art dealer, Alfredo Geri, at Borgo Osterat, and intriguingly signed, Leonardo. Jerry era senz'altro uno dei più importanti antiquari. Jerry was without doubt one of the most important antique dealers in Florence at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. And he belonged to a very select group of art connoisseurs specializing in historical Italian paintings. Perugia had spotted an ad Jerry had placed in the newspapers offering to buy works of art in Italy. He'd written letters to other art dealers in Europe, but no one had replied, until now. He writes to this G um, Italian uh, Fl Florentine uh, uh, antique dealer, uh, saying, uh, 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 this is, uh, I'm, I'm selling the, the Mona Lisa. He calls himself Leonardo. <laughs> and the man is rather intrigued by this letter. Think of maybe throwing it, uh, it away, but uh, mentions it to uh, the director of the Uffizi Museum. And the man says, just in case, answer this letter. Incredibly, the letter offered the return of the Mona Lisa for the Italian nation. No money was mentioned, but the letter writer said he was poor and needy. That there was something about the letter, the story, it was worth having a look anyway. And maybe it was not the Mona Lisa, maybe it was another painting important. I mean, even a copy of the Mona Lisa in the 17th century would be quite a remarkable find. So the, the instinct is, well, let, let's go and have a look. By return post, Leonardo is invited to come to Florence. At his flat in Paris, Perugia takes the unframed Mona Lisa on wooden board and packs it into a trunk. Arriving at the Gare de l'Est, he buys a third-class train ticket for Florence. For the first time in over 300 years, the Mona Lisa is about to leave France. Packed into a battered trunk and vulnerable to even the slightest damage, Leonardo's masterpiece is about to endure her final indignity. By the time Perugia arrives in Florence, it's night. 
tired after his long journey, he walks to the city center. Finally, he books a room in this small hotel on the Via Panzini. The Mona Lisa is pushed under his bed in the trunk. The next morning, Perugia would have woken to the sound of the bells from the Duomo. The opportunity he's waited two years for is almost within his grasp. To steady his nerves, he walks through the center of Florence and across the Ponte Vecchio, pausing briefly to gather his thoughts. His meeting with Alfredo Jerry and Poggi is just one hour away. Finally, he goes back to his hotel. What's about to happen in this small room in Florence will go down in history. So you can imagine Vincenzo Perugia being in a rather poor um, hotel for poor people. And these two gentlemen, one is a famous art dealer, the other one is the curator of the Uffizi, the most important art gallery in Italy. And then they go to his uh, small room, a small hotel room, and under the bed there's the wooden box. And in the wooden box, per personal belongings of uh, Pe Perugia and even a mandolina. <laughs> and then he takes off the, the bottom planks of the, of, the, of the box and wrapped in a piece of fabric. Uh, here is the Mona Lisa. And the, the two men know from this instant that this is the real one. It's, I mean, it's not a copy, it's not an imitation. This is the one. He shows them the painting everybody's been looking for. The painting has a very, very tiny cacolu, as the French call it, little cracklings, uh, uh, which is due to the oil painting uh, dried over the centuries. And they have uh, pictures of it, a photograph. And this is like having the fingerprint of the painter. You cannot imitate uh, uh, over thousands and thousands of little cracklings. And it does take them a minute or two to realize it's a one. Having established it's the real painting, they now lay a trap for Perugia. So they convince Vincenzo that uh, we, they are going to bring back uh, the painting and put it in the Uffizi so that the Italian people can see their pride and joy once again. And they, uh, and they leave the hotel with uh, the uh, painting, only to be stopped by the concierge of the hotel, who suspects them of having stolen one of the artwork, if you can imagine the kind of artwork, which would be in uh, the rooms there. They show the concierge that, no, no, it's not, it doesn't belong to the hotel, it's just this. And the concierge looks at it, obviously does not recognize the famous painting, and says, oh, that's, that's all right then, and off they go and they call the Carabinieri, who shortly afterwards arrest uh, the poor Vincenzo Perugia. Perugia is finally charged and sent to trial. But for many, what was truly astonishing wasn't just the theft itself. It was that the Mona Lisa, painted on wood, had survived without cover or protection in a shabby trunk for over two years. I think the great merit of the great luck of Vincenzo Perugia is that he was able to do all that, that is, remove the painting from the frame, from the glass, take it, steal it, take it to his room, change the room, and then in the middle of winter, go on a third-class uh, train compartment um, all the way to Florence, uh, uh, and nothing happened to the painting. When you think that the painting now is the most ultra-protected painting in the world, kept in a box at the Louvre with a silicone gel and all sorts of mechanisms to ensure that there is not the slightest change in temperature um, to, to make sure that the wood would not, uh, would, not, would not crack. Well, Perugia was either very skilled, or lucky, or both. At his trial, Perugia was convicted and sentenced to one year and 15 days. He told the court his motive for the theft was purely nationalistic. He wanted the Mona Lisa to hang in the Uffizi Gallery in company with other great Italian Renaissance masterpieces. Even at the time, I don't think people thought of him as a hero. They thought of him more as a stupid person, a thief, a small thief. 
But he did get some sympathy because his justification was to return the picture to Italy and he'd taken it in such a naive way. But in the end, he did have to spend a year and 15 days in the prison in Florence, which is a very old and grim prison. But as Perugia languished in jail, his dream finally did become a reality, albeit briefly. The Mona Lisa was exhibited in the Uffizi Gallery for one month. The painting was put exactly here, in this corner, on a small easel facing the wall. So the painting was here, and the line of people following the normal route through the gallery would end up here and be able to admire Leonardo's masterpiece. One month later, she was returned to the Louvre in triumph. In reality, in a sense, the sadness at the loss of the Mona Lisa is not so great when you consider that there are a great many Italian works of art which remain in private collections today, which were taken from us during the Napoleonic era. So, for us Italians, the sale of the Mona Lisa to France is not such a national tragedy because there were so many Renaissance paintings which have been, if you like, stolen. <laughs> but that wasn't the end of the story. 20 years later, an extraordinary new twist came to light. A twist that, if true, would cast real doubt on Perugia's role as the nationalistic fanatic acting alone. In 1931, an American journalist, Carl Decker, published an interview he made with a man called Eduardo do Valfiano. Decker was told he could never publish this until Valfiano died. Valfiano was a con man and art dealer. He aimed high and sold old Spanish masters to private wealthy clients. According to Decker, Valfiano had set up business with a talented art restorer called Yves Chaudron. Valfiano, ever the opportunist, had an idea to use Chaudron for his ultimate con, forging the Mona Lisa, but it would be a tough challenge. Well, Leonardo's uh, method of painting and the method of painting that was employed during the Renaissance was very particular and very, actually very complicated and careful. And it would have taken him four to five years to master the actual craft of painting. Um, his technique would have been fairly innovative for the time, but certainly it would have been very careful and involved a, a high degree of preparation. Um, all of the pigments would have had to have been ground by hand using a pestle and mortar and then mixed with the medium, whether that was egg white, egg yolk or oil. He would paint an area, let it dry, paint it with very, very thin uh, brushes, um, let it dry and then paint again on top, building it up layer upon layer. Um, a lot of the beauty of the Mona Lisa and some of uh, Leonardo's other paintings depends on this painstakingly uh, slow technique which, uh, which, he, which he used. So it took him four years um, to paint the Mona Lisa. By 1910, Valfierno had asked Chaudron to paint another five copies of the Mona Lisa. Valfierno had himself been busy. He'd started to contact wealthy clients who might be interested in owning the world's greatest picture. Valfierno's fakes were now ready to be shipped across the Atlantic. Five were stored in a warehouse in New York City. The sixth went to Buenos Aires. But who could possibly believe they were about to own the world's greatest painting when the real thing was still in the Louvre? Well, I think that you know, any plan to forge the Mona Lisa would have been an extremely brave and ambitious one, given the difficulties involved of replicating the painting to a convincing effect. But one has to remember that in 1910, 
A good deal of uh, the world would not have seen the Mona Lisa. Travel was not so easy, and one couldn't just nip across to the Louvre and have a look at the, at the original. So people were less familiar with what the Mona Lisa actually looked like. So it's conceivable, I think, that if the copy was of a high quality, that perhaps people who were not so familiar with the original might have been fooled into thinking that it really was the Mona Lisa. According to Decker, Valfierno now put his master plan into action. He set about trying to find someone to steal the Mona Lisa. The press coverage would be worldwide, and his clients would now believe they really were going to own da Vinci's masterpiece. He could then go to potential owners, and he could say, you know the Mona Lisa was stolen six months ago, well, I've got it, and you can have it. Um, for a significant amount of money. And of course, the, the, the potential buyers couldn't possibly talk to anybody else about it. So the fact that there were five or six of these forgeries in existence would never be revealed, certainly not revealed in the, uh, in, within people's normal lifetimes. Valfierno's meal ticket was a young Italian carpenter who already worked at the Louvre, Vincenzo Perugia. But Perugia, wouldn't be the only robber that night. According to Decker, he would also have two accomplices with him, hired by Valfierno. We must understand that the story of Vincenzo Perugia was a terrible disappointment uh, for people who like uh, um, you know, a good art story. The thief must be a gentleman thief, who must be an art connoisseur, who must love art. There must be an American millionaire in the background prepared to pay extraordinary sums in order just to look at the Mona Lisa in, 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 his, in his large uh, uh, villa or, um, or house. And instead, what do we get? We get this rather ignorant, almost illiterate man. But Valfierno had one more trick up his sleeve. Once Perugia had gone to Florence and tried to sell it in Italy, the Mona Lisa, of course, returned to the Louvre. Once the, the forgeries have been sold, even if the original is recovered, there is never any suspicion going to fall upon the, the person who sold the forgeries, and who, who was behind the original theft, because that person can always go back to his buyers and say, well, of course, they can't admit that they've not got it back, so they had a copy made. The Valfierno connection was never verified, and some are skeptical that it ever happened. Well, one would need some kind of evidence that that has actually occurred. Now, it might have been difficult to find any evidence in 1915 or 1920, but by now, surely, the uh, copies which are in the vaults of these millionaires would have come up. And whenever someone says, I have the real Mona Lisa, it's in my attic, it's in my basement, and anyone has a look at it, it's pretty obvious that it doesn't look at all like a Renaissance painting. There's one very bizarre incident. It's a good one. Of course, it's not the slightest evidence for it. Valfierno died in 1931, and Decker's secret interview with the con man, known also as the Marques, was published that same year. But what's never been disputed is Perugia's role in possibly the greatest art heist of all time. Perugia was released from prison and was welcomed back to his hometown in Italy, a hero. Two months later, it's the it's, uh, First World War. He uh, fights in, in the war on the, in the Italian troops. And then after the war, uh, goes back to Paris. And he died in the 20s, we don't exactly know when, uh, in the suburb of Paris, completely unknown and forgotten. But as it turned out, Perugia was to have his last moment of fame. When he died, um, he had obituaries in all the Italian papers as the man who stole the Mona Lisa, which is not bad for a poor Italian immigrant. The theft of the Mona Lisa was an extraordinary worldwide event, but even more extraordinary was that it had been carried out successfully by a poor immigrant Italian carpenter who kept the most famous painting in the world by his bed for over two years. But it is an extraordinary story since uh, we know that the painting was already so famous. So uh, to be able to steal such a thing, I mean, it's a symbol of, uh, of uh, I don't know, of, of uh, European culture, 
disappearing suddenly and, and with the fear that it can be destroyed by a madman. So it's, I mean, it's really, uh, the story is unbelievable.